beyond the horizon lies a world, a place powered by sunlight, where with respect for nature and culture, the lightest touch becomes our greatest mark. Where beyond the wonder, adventure awaits. A place where luxury is woven within the beauty around us. The Red Sea. Sea beyond. All you, you see here is reality. We have transformed our vision into reality, and it's, it's um, an honorable moment for all of us. We are at uh, Red Sea Global have delivered in our promise to Saudi Vision 2030. Our panel will soon will be discussing what the world can learn from Vision 2030. And I'm deeply honored to be your moderator on such a topic. I am Ahmed Derwish the Group Chief Administrative Officer at Red Sea Global. I am thrilled to welcome you to this FII panel discussion. We got an incredible panel of experts. Soon we will join together. And we are diving into the transformative impact and the valuable lessons from Vision 2030. Specifically, how it is equipping Saudis with the necessity skills and to thrive in an ever global changing economy. Now let me set the stage first. According to the World Economic Forum, 60% of all workers will need to be retrained by 2027, yet only half of them have access to training today. McKinsey warns us that one in 16 people might have to switch jobs by 2030, especially in the face of automation, machine learning, and so on. In Saudi Arabia, our youth demographics is significant with over 60% Saudis younger than the age of 35. They include as also many ambitious Saudi women looking in to join the workforce. Vision 2030 is our compass. And our roadmap to strengthen the economy, create jobs, and prepare our youth for the future. And we're making progress. The kingdom is ranked ninth worldwide in the UNDP Technical and Vocational Training Index. We have outperformed Finland, New Zealand, and Singapore. The tourism industry is a great example of the need for new skill sets. Tourism offer huge potential for upward mobility in our transforming economy and my company's experience proves this point. Red Sea Global plays an integral role in driving Saudi Vision 2030 forward. We just launched the Red Sea destination, as you saw in the video, with Six, Six Senses Southern Dune Resort already welcoming guests. We're getting reservations, requests from around the world, and our Red Sea International Airport is already operating and receiving flights. There is so much still to come. Two more resorts this year, inshallah. St. Regis and Red Scotland Reserve. 30 more hotels are coming next year, and a total of 50 resorts at the Red Sea destination by 2030. And that's not it. Our second flagship destination, Amala, will follow. Welcoming visitors in 2025, once it's completed, Amala will have a total of 29 resorts. You see, for us, it's not just about tourism, it's about jobs. Both for our destinations will generate a total of 120,000 jobs by 2030. We are already making it happen. We're creating life-changing opportunities for our youth through
through high quality educational programs linked to the requirements of the market with more than 1,200 beneficiaries until today. We have trained boat captains, landscapers, chefs, and more. A few months back, we had 430 Saudis graduated from the vocational training program, and they have already secured jobs with us or with our partners. In addition, we have our elite graduate program that provides on-the-job training, on training for fresh graduates from universities. Between 2022 and 2023, an overwhelming 110,000 people applied for this program. And now we have 250 young Saudis who have entered the program and now actively contributing and working towards shaping the Red Sea destination and Amala as we speak. 20 of them after the graduation have advanced to be in the management levels. 38% of our graduates of the elites have joined a leadership development program. And the most remarkable one is the retention rate is 92%. This is significant for us. One of them is Fahad al -Dosiri. Fahad studied to be a petroleum engineer. Now he's an acting supervisor at Red Sea International Airport. We also trained Alia Saleh al Zahrani. She's a former freelance graphic designer who now is rocking it as an assistant chef at our St. Regis Red Sea. It's amazing. And Mutab al Asami, who works at our landscape nursery. Mutab has been promoted several times since he joined in 2020, and now he's a senior manager. So proud of all of them, honestly. We're building careers. We're not just building resorts. Careers that have profound impact on our youth, enabling them to follow their dreams. These were some of the success stories that embodies the new tourism generation shaping Saudi Arabia's future. In fact, here at FII, more than 75 Red Sea Global vocational students and talents and elites are showcasing their skills. If you are one of them, please stand. These are our students, guys. Very proud of you all. Red Sea Global is just one example of a broader movement in Saudi Arabia that is contributing to Vision 2030's goals for training, inspiring, enabling, and empowering citizens because it's all about real people, their stories, their success, not just economic statistics. As we jump into today's discussion, let's remember behind every percentage point, there is a real person. The legacy of Saudi Vision 2030 will be a human legacy. A human legacy, and it is clear to all of us who is the one shaping this legacy. There is something very important His Highness once said, confirming the importance of this matter. His Highness said, and I quote, youth are the real energy and real power to achieve this vision. And our most important advantage is that, the, that our youth are conscious, educated, creative, and have high values." End of his quote. And we're proud to play our part in reassuring that, inshallah. Thank you very much. And now, thank you very much. <laughs> and now, please uh, join me in welcoming Mr. Turki Abdullah Jawini, Director General of Human Resources Development Fund, HRDF. Mr. Ashish Advani, President and CEO of JA Worldwide. <laughs> Mr. Jihad Bissis, CEO of Group Amana. Please. <laughs> All right, welcome to the panel discussion. Uh, this is a very amazing moment. It's great to be with you on, the, on this panel. And uh, would like to go through the table and ask you a few questions, enrich our uh, audience with the amazing information. Starting with you, Mr. Turkey. Uh, Saudi Arabia aims to advance or expand the high growth sector like tourism, 
exponentially by, uh, by 2030, inshallah. How can policymakers and business work together to forecast skills needed for those new industries and strategically develop talent through partnership? <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Ahmed, uh, for hosting this, uh, this panel. I'm proud to be among uh, my colleagues here. And I would like to uh, take this opportunity to wish all the participants uh, in this year's uh, uh, Future Investment Initiative all the best in the coming uh, two days. Before I address the question, um, uh, I would like to give a quick overview on Human Resources Development Fund and its mandate. Um, since the establishment of the fund back in the year uh, 2000, it was mandated uh, with the uh, development, uh, skilling, and training and employment of the national uh, Saudi workforce in the private sector. Uh, this has been addressed by a variety of programs and initiatives uh, that the programs uh, manage, uh, or the fund manage. Uh, um, uh, uh, and uh, frankly, uh, it's uh, uh, as of today, uh, and uh, with the establishment of the Vision 2030 by His Royal Highness Prince Mohammed bin Salman, uh, we believe that both the policymakers and uh, businesses ha are well equipped um, uh, to uh, uh, anticipate the uh, skill sets needed in the future and address the dynamics of the labor market demands. Um, HRDF sits in the forefront of, of uh, some of these initiatives, working closely with um, uh, uh, stakeholders such as the Ministry of Human Resources and Social Development the um, uh, s different sector uh, regulatory bodies, uh, the uh, 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 private sector as well. And we have um, uh, gotten our strategy approved last year, 2022, exactly in October, by the uh, National Development Fund, where we have um, uh, identified three strategic objectives for the Human Resources Development Fund. The first objective is to foster the human capital development in accordance with the labor market demand. Um, our second objective is to optimize the uh, correlation between the uh, 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 labor supply and the demand side. And the last one is to facilitate a sustainable employment for, uh, in the private sector for the most vulnerable segments of uh, beneficiaries. And in order for us to implement uh, the strategy uh, and facilitate um, uh, for the skill forecasting, uh, there were several initiatives that we have launched uh, in the last couple of years. Uh, the first one is we have established a strategic partnership uh, in alignment with the objectives and projects of Division 2030. Uh, these partnerships uh, are developed through an analysis of uh, promising sectors uh, and the respective uh, uh, supply and demand dynamics. Such sectors include the tourism sector, uh, the um, uh, transportation and logistic, uh, manufacturing, healthcare, ICT, cybersecurity, and others. Um, in each of these partnerships, uh, we basically aim to evaluate the uh, potential requirements when it comes to the skill sets needed and evaluate even the gap that exists today uh, uh, on the marketplace. And we do combine this, we did combine this with our recent revamp of our programs to make sure that we have the tools uh, that could equip the young Saudis with the necessary skills moving forward. Um, we also have 24 agreements with the mega projects and uh, mega companies in Saudi Arabia that are active as of today. These agreements are collectively valued at 1.5, more than 1.5 billion Saudi Rial. The tourism sector, Ahmed, is, uh, is accounting for almost 230 million <coughs> Saudi Rial. Uh, so you're way above the 10%. Uh, uh, we have, uh, in the tourism sector specifically, we have partnered with, obviously, the uh, Red Sea Development Company. Uh, we're working in developing and training uh, uh, 1,500 Saudi nationals. Sure. We just celebrated, as you said, the graduation of the first batch of 430 30. of them. 
Uh, we also have uh, a collaboration with the uh, Development Authority of uh, al Dir'iya Gate as well as the Royal Commission of al Ula. Uh, within the tourism sector as a whole, uh, we were able to facilitate the employment of more than 108,000 Saudis, uh, providing 850,000 training sessions and um, incorporating 22 uh, professional tourism uh, training certificate, uh, certificates into the profile. With that being said, and I'll close uh, with this point, um, it was always important to uh, understand any current skill gap that exists in the marketplace and to also have the necessary tools and insight for any future uh, skills that are needed. This is why uh, uh, last year we have um, initiated the repositioning of the National Labor Observatory, which sits within the fund. The NLO is the North Star uh, for the labor market. It will uh, 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 be the primary source of data and, and insight uh, with regard to the uh, labor market as a whole. It will extend its uh, uh, services by publishing uh, and sharing insight with different stakeholders, including policymakers, investors, uh, job seekers, researchers. And uh, in the meantime, we are currently working with the Ministry of Human Resources and Social Development to transfer the supply demand uh, forecast unit into the NLO. Uh, this will help uh, the NLO predict uh, the future uh, market needs in quantities and in terms of skill sets. Amazing. Thank you. And I can attest to the programs that you're uh, providing, the partnership that was created with HRD. Absolutely. It was one of a kind. We're grateful to everything that you're giving to Red Sea and to the kingdom as a whole. Thank you Thank very you much. So much. Thank you, likewise. Thank you. Right. Mr. Jihad, uh, as the new sectors grow, what supply chain adaptation and workforce coordination can align labor market needs with citizens' capabilities? How, and how can data analysis tools like the National Labor Observation inform all of this? Please. Right. Uh, just to give a bit of context. Yes. Uh, we are contractors. We've been in the country for the past 16 years, Amana. And uh, we had a leap of faith from the Red Sea when they awarded uh, several projects to us to build in modular construction. Correct. Today, there is uh, probably more than 30 buildings inhabited by your staff uh, in the Red Sea. And we're very grateful for that. What brings context uh, to this question and modularity is construction as a whole is one of the oldest professions on the planet. And only lately, there have been disruptive uh, technologies in it, mostly on the design side. But when we come to constructing, it's very common that you construct at the project site. And historically, being able to attract local talent to work on construction sites have been quite tough for several reasons. One, the working conditions. Second, by definition, when you work in remote areas, there aren't people living there. So it's hard to attract them to go to work there. And when the jobs have a defined duration, and when the job is done, the job is done. So now as we move into modular construction, and we're basically industrializing construction by bringing 80% of the job site to an industrial environment, to our assembly units, majority of the work is being done in that assembly unit. So when we first started this approach, it was in the beginning of COVID, we set up our assembly units here, and we started producing. 100,000 square meters today, this is where we are. Where the future is, and what we hope is the market would open up more for modular construction as part of the modern methods of construction, is that as an industry, we start having construction complexes. So imagine an automotive where the core of that automotive complex is the assembly, is what we do, modular. The supply chain is around it, feeding it. From this construction complex, you're able to serve multiple projects across the kingdom. And you have these complexes at different parts of the kingdom. So you basically bring the threat to attracting local talent to work in remote areas to an industrialized environment where you can focus on training, you can focus on development, and then you can progress more with long-term uh, incentive plans Then you can get your ambitious local talent to start owning those small pilot supply chain around the uh, industrial complex. We strongly believe, given the ambitions of 2030, uh, we were given a, a leap of faith by, initially by Red Sea and many clients thereafter, and Neon followed, 
to deliver in this method. And if the market picks up on this, I believe we can put, and we discussed this earlier, we can put construction on a track that's able to attract and retain and develop a lot of the local, uh, local talent. Exceptional. And I remember your factory that you set up in Rabagh for Red Sea. It's an exceptional story where all the locals were higher than that factory. Great job. Mr. Ashish, um, how can policymakers and business, businesses collaborate to build appealing career pathways in priority sectors? And what reforms or incentives help attract and retain competitive Saudi talent over the long term for our youth? A simple question, very complicated to answer, yes. honestly. <laughs> uh, let me start by um, sort of stepping back and making this more personal for the people in the room and to think about um, how many jobs and careers many of you may have had. We heard your great statistics from McKinsey and the World Economic Forum about how there's so much change and so much unpredictability in the job market of the future and the skills of the future. So even when we think of ourselves and how many careers and jobs we've had, uh, we know there's gonna be an exponential change. And we know that the mindset that whether it's Saudi youth or youth anywhere in the world have to learn is this mindset of resilience and being willing to learn new things. Now the question is how can civil society, how can NGOs like mine, um, how can government and how can business collaborate to help young people develop that mindset cost effectively? And um, I'd say one thing that at least I've learned in my journeys is um, the role that NGOs play is increasingly uh, complicated and challenged because a young person needs many experiences to actually have uh, a new mindset. It can't happen through one intervention. It can't happen through one program. So really, all these sectors have to collaborate multiple times, including with on-the-job training, like you mentioned, that you do. If you've got contract workers who've got to switch careers and switch places they work, um, it requires this sort of mindset and skill set that it's okay to move and it's okay to do something different. And I think that example is a good example for how um, the role of nonprofits and the role of government and the role of the education sector has to really focus on this mindset. Some very specific things you can even do for your own kids to help build that mindset now. One is to help them build this idea of self-efficacy. I don't know if you've heard that term, but it's, a, it's actually a psychological construct. You can measure it, you can train people for it. Um, if you have a role model who's come from your background and has had you know, many career shifts, uh, maybe even some involuntary, right? If a young person's gonna switch careers seven times and jobs 20 times, it's possible some of those changes will be involuntary. You're gonna get fired. And right now we think of getting fired as this awful thing, but even changing the mindset of a young person to make them feel that that's okay. It's okay to fail, it's okay to change, it's okay to pivot. Um, that starts very early. In fact, I was, you know, as, I, as I prepared for my remarks here, I was looking at, the, at, at not only Vision 2030, but the mandate specifically for the HRDF. Mm -hmm. And one of the specific parts of the mandate, which I think is really a model for other countries, is to develop a positive attitude in young people. I, I haven't seen that explicitly listed as a goal of most uh, sort of human resource development programs around the world, and it's so critical, particularly in this region where historically there's been you know, a more conservative approach to change. And having that explicit, that self-efficacy, that resilience built into the goal, I think is, um, is a model. Amazing, thank you. Mr. Turkey, back to you. Uh, HRDF plays a key role in empowering businesses investing in Saudi Arabia by building capabilities for national uh, cadres. What are some of the most effective upskilling and placement programs you have seen the fund uh, implement? I think all of them are effective uh, in, in a way or another. Uh, they play a role um, uh, in a different journeys of the uh, job seekers. Uh, and I will elaborate more on some of the programs uh, uh, later on. But before I, I, I go into details of the programs, let me share with you some, some uh, uh, facts regarding the performance of HRDF uh, during uh, the, the, the last nine months or the first nine months of this year. Um, uh, so basically we dispersed uh, uh, our dispersed supporting uh, 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 for, for the first nine months of the year was almost 6.9 billion Saudi Riyal. Uh, for almost 1.68 million beneficiaries and 97,000 enterprises 
uh, most of them are classified as small and middle uh, enterprises. Uh, we think that we play an integral role uh, in collaboration with the Ministry of Investment as well, um, acting as the facilitator uh, for the human capital track under the banner of the Invest in Saudi. Uh, and uh, as part of our strategy, we have um, uh, launched um, about two years ago uh, a very core project uh, uh, to redesign our programs. And uh, this extensive uh, project uh, involved the development of the uh, new products and mechanism uh, to ensure uh, that we are servicing our diverse uh, beneficiaries, both individuals and enterprises as well. Uh, we have enhanced our uh, content of these programs, and we have also revamped our operational uh, by applying uh, modern technology and digital transformation. Uh, today, we have eight main programs uh, that we are proud of, and I'll share some insight of the programs. Uh, the first one is the uh, training uh, support, uh, uh, which is a guaranteed employment program. In this program, uh, HRDF uh, subsidize uh, from 75% to 90% of the training cost uh, uh, with an agreement with the private sector. Uh, the uh, training uh, uh, time frame can go up to two years and a half, uh, similar to the one that we have worked with, uh, with the Red Sea Development Company. Uh, you know, we have taken into consideration while designing the program the different dynamics and needs of the different economic sectors. Uh, uh, we have also included the, uh, uh, the overseas training option, uh, particularly in areas where we lack the training facilities in the kingdom. Uh, a recent example is Lucid Motors, where we have uh, a, a thousand uh, Saudi individuals uh, lined up for the training over the next few years. 180 of them will attend their training in the United States. And we are proud to be part of um, uh, the partnership with Lucid in helping establish their first manufacturing facility outside of the United States, which was inaugurated a few, we a few weeks back in Saudi Arabia. The second uh, program, and that probably relates to your, uh, to your point regarding the mandate, is the career counseling. Uh, this program was launched back in uh, August 2022. Um, we have recently broadened our coverage on the program to include uh, students at high school and college. Uh, whereby with, the, uh, uh, with our uh, career counselors, helping them uh, uh, at an early stage to decide on their future journey and understand the potential uh, career opportunities that's await awaiting for them. Uh, uh, so far, uh, since inception, we have served almost 150,000 uh, uh, students across the kingdom uh, with our career counseling. The, um, the income support is probably the largest uh, program that we have in terms of, of uh, disbursement. Uh, uh, and this is where we uh, participate with the private sector uh, in uh, subsidizing the wage of the Saudi nationals for a period up to two years. The subsidy is between 30 to 50% of the wage, and it has a cap of 3,000 riyals per month. Uh, today, we have 245,000 individuals who are subsidized in the private sector, uh, serving at approximately 34,000 enterprises across the kingdom. Uh, on the job training is an essential program uh, that we provide free of charge. We do have a, a platform, Droop. Uh, we have more than uh, 300 70. Uh, 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 the, the online training, 370 uh, uh, certificates uh, that are available. More than 605,000 individuals have benefited from our uh, online training. The on-job training, um, Tamir, uh, uh, gives the opportunity to the uh, job seekers, the fresh graduates, to have a uh, training opportunity within the private sectors to uh, uh, prepare them for their uh, uh, career uh, with no cost to the enterprises at all. HRDF will uh, provide the training allowance directly to the uh, trainee. 
and the empowerment program, which is mainly designed to ensure uh, labor market uh, inclusivity to all uh, segment, uh, to all the segments of the society. For example, empowering uh, the working women uh, by uh, giving them the transportation allowance and the uh, uh, child care allowance, as well the uh, uh, the handicapped segment. Uh, uh, so, in 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 general, uh, I think uh, HRDF has been an instrumental in accelerating the kingdom's uh, uh, growth and uh, economic prosperity through the uh, range of programs that it provides, uh, with, especially with the recent uh, redesign that we have conducted over the last year and a half. Excellent. I can attest to all those programs. We're using it as Red Sea Global. It's been extremely beneficial. It helps us to bring a lot of Saudis, especially young, Thank you. into the mix. So great job. Thank you. All right, Mr. Jihad, Vision 2030 is a long uh, term. And there are multiple stages, approaches to developing the uh, citizen skills and localizing industry. Looking ahead for you, what are the biggest task force pipeline and capability challenges that needs to be tackled in the next five to 10 years? Our vision 2030, it's, it's, in terms of construction, it's closer than 2030 by far. Yes. As far as to be ready, there's a lot of work, uh, a lot of work to be done. Uh, in terms of uh, training and development, uh, the way we see it forward is expanding into those construction complexes uh, to develop on the training of, uh, of local talent. And more so, in terms of attracting the local talent, we have to think out of the box as contractors, be it from hybrid working, be it using, uh, being with multiple collaboration across different areas that we operate in. We have to think out of the box to cope with speed. We have to think out of the box to cope with retention. Uh, be it retention in, of general talent, because construction now in Saudi, it's, it's, it's a vortex for resources. So to be able to retain that talent, be it local or even uh, expat, is a challenge. Great. And companies, even though we're modular, we're all about delivering in boxes, but we have to think out of the box to be able to retain, uh, to retain this. So in summary, I would say it's uh, think more modular, uh, work more in parallel, uh, skill individuals, be it the workforce uh, with the direct construction or the designers in the office, skill them in a manner where they become specialized, they're well equipped digitally for the future, to work in parallel to allow meeting the aggressive schedules needed uh, for construction in support of 2030. Excellent. Thank you so much. Mr. Shish, we close with your statement. Uh, from a global perspective, what aspects of Saudi Arabia's holistic, long-term human capital development model have the most potential for replication? And how can other countries apply these lessons? So, we want your reflection. Thank you. Uh, it's my pleasure to have that. That's, it's an it's a important question, and um, I already gave the example earlier of having something as explicit as building a positive attitude in young people being written into a plan is rare. So that would be one thing I'd come back to as a good model for others to learn from. There's a few others. One is um, explicitly this idea of investing in early childhood education. That is um, explicitly part of the plan to grow from I think 23% to 90% um, um, young people in kindergarten by 2030. Uh, a lot of other plans I don't see having early childhood as explicit. And I know we haven't talked about it in this panel, but I think it is probably one of the um, core differentiators of this plan in terms of long-term investment. Another is um, being um, clear about global citizenship skills. So um, both the World Economic Forum Education 4.0 framework um, and the G20 uh, education framework have called out the need for really all governments to support global citizenship skills. And I saw that called out specifically not just in the plan but also through funding exchange programs, funding scholarships for Saudis to go abroad, and creating visa situations to allow students to come here. Uh, I, I cannot um, sort of um, you know, overstate the importance, particularly given the craziness of the world at any given point in time these days, how important those global citizenship skills are. And so that was nice to see um, in the plan as a model for others to follow. The fact that you are also providing you know, allowances for students to learn 
um, which you pointed out are so welcome, that is something which uh, I think would be, um, you know, an, it's an excellent model for others to consider if they can afford it. They provide the financials and we provide the jobs after they finish. It's, I mean, it's fantastic. So it's, it's, uh, it's just it's, a, it's, a great it, ecosystem. It really is a model for others. And finally, I would just say experiential learning uh, writ large, I see it throughout this plan and from co-op experiences to on-the-job training to um, you know, various types of apprenticeships and internships, I think um, having those funded and be explicit is also a model for others to follow. With my own NGO, we operate in 115 countries and our brand here in the Middle East is Injaz, so Injaz Saudi, you may know it, or Injaz Al Arab. Um, we help support these internships and um, it's really is a partnership between business, government and NGOs, which I think is a good role model for other uh, countries to follow. Amazing, amazing. Well, thank you very much for your participation thank you. and uh, enriching information. I hope you enjoyed the session. Thank I know you. I did. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.